All right, guys, welcome. My name is Guy McPherson, and I want to thank you so much for joining me here uh, at the Trauma Therapist Project's online training, Becoming a Trauma Therapist. We're going to get started in about uh, 30 seconds or so. If uh, you're a, um, uh, a trauma therapist, if you're a therapist, if you're, if you're looking forward and eager to get into the field of trauma therapy and wondering what steps to take, this online training is for you. Again, we're going to get started here in about 30 seconds. Grab some water, grab some tea, grab some coffee. I've got my coffee and tea. And we're going to get started in about 30 seconds. All right. All right, guys, here we go. Just had a sip of my coffee. And again, I'm so thankful that you're here joining me today. Again, my name is Guy McPherson, and you're in the right spot if uh, you're looking for the free online training, Becoming a Trauma Therapist. Um, this is uh, the Trauma Therapist Project's uh, free online training. My name is Guy McPherson, and let's get into it. Let's get right into it today. So my goals here for this free online training are uh, several. Number one, to provide you with the basic foundational information uh, necessary to get into this field and to become a trauma therapist. If you have uh, hesitancies, if you're wondering what steps to take, where do I start, uh, this is the training for you. And believe me, I was there several years ago. I'm also going to be talking about the three pillars to becoming a trauma therapist, the, the necessary steps, the necessary ingredients that you need if you're going to get into this field. And these were honed um, and inspired by the over 200 thought leaders and masters in this field that I've interviewed on the Trauma Therapist Project podcast rather. Also, one of the goals is to allay some of your concerns and fears uh, to help you avoid the mistakes that I've made, certainly. And again, most, if not all, I would probably say that all uh, of the interviewees and the guests I've had on the podcast have made. They've Everyone has made mistakes. Obviously, we're all human getting into this field. But in this training, I'm going to share with you what those mistakes were and to help you avoid them as you begin your journey. Uh, also to share some basic yet crucial skills, interventions of trauma therapists, and finally to inspire you. So we're going to go for about an hour. Um, I'm trying to keep it at that and, um, and let's go. So the outline here, uh, I'm going to provide br a brief background of who I am, why you should be listening to this in the first place, uh, go into what it takes, uh, your, your trauma toolkit in a sense, ingredients, intros to fundamental and crucial skills, uh, moving forward. And I'm going to provide you, for those of you who hang out till the end, I've got actually uh, two downloads, uh, PDFs I want to offer you. One is a free roadmap and the other is a PDF of a short but awesome book list. So you want to stick around for those. Certainly, if you have any questions, uh, jot them down uh, below the screen here, and I will get back to you uh, as quickly as is humanly possible. But um, all right, so why me? Let's get started here. Why me? Why are you listening to this? Again, my name is Guy McPherson. Um, I have a PhD in clinical psychology. Um, I've spent most of my time uh, really honing my skills in trauma therapy early psychosis. I, I currently work in a clinic here in California that specializes in assessing and treating uh, young young kids uh, between the ages of 12 and 25, mostly 16, 17, who are showing early signs of psychosis, and most of whom, I would say 95%, um, have uh, trauma experience. So really excited about that work that I do there. How I get into this, I mean, I this is this picture is not me, but it's it's just how I feel. I mean, I'm so excited about this field and really the journey uh, into it and where it's taken me. But I want to share with you today three stories that have inspired me, uh, really that have launched me into this field. And the first has to do with my brother. 
as many of you know, if you've been listening to the podcast, my brother was, or is, I should say, a former Navy SEAL. And when he got back, he came back from Iraq with PTSD. And when he came back, I was so excited uh, about just learning everything that he'd done. I wanted to hear the details of the missions he'd gone on. And I pestered him and I nagged him. And he was like, guy, you know what? I just really... We don't want to talk about it. Well, why are you so interested in this? He would he would tell me, and I nagged him, and I nagged him, and I tried to pull it out of him. I tried to get him to talk about it, and this was way before I knew anything about trauma and PTSD, and even certainly, uh, you know, working with it or dealing with it or, or uh, talking to anyone who's who's had it, and I just blew it. I mean, I, I I blew it in the sense that I just was relentless. And it wasn't until many years later when I knew what the heck was going on. Um, and part of my, I should say a large part of why I'm doing this is to kind of correct that, is to, to get back in there and to, to help educate other people about how to deal with manage and work with and help um, heal individuals who have PTSD and or who've been traumatized. So that's the first thing. The second sh short story I want to share with you has to do with an old friend of mine. I was several years ago living in Los Angeles. I'd been writing fiction and I was sitting in this room and the phone rang. And it was an old friend that... Um, I hadn't spoken with in a pretty long time, and she was calling all of her friends to tell them that she had AIDS. She'd had been living with AIDS for, she said, nine years at the time, and she was really preparing to die. And I was sitting on the phone listening to her passion, listening to her courage, listening to her strength, and all these feelings were going through my head. Obviously, just disbelief, sadness. And when I hung up the phone with her, I felt a, a gaping hole in the pit of my stomach. And the question, what am I doing with my life? Here was a woman who was facing her death in a sense, but with such courage again and such passion. And I knew that I didn't have that. Or I felt that I didn't have that in my life. And I asked myself, what am I doing with my life? And it really led me to this third uh, event, which was a journey. I mean, I got off of that phone with my friend and I said to myself, I need to find that. I need to find my passion. I need to find my strength about you know who I am. And it led me on this survival course. Really, uh, a year's worth of of searching and one of these events that i went on this really pivotal event was a survival course out in the utah desert middle of nowhere i'd never done anything like this and there was a group of about 15 or so people uh, accompanied by three guides and these people were amazing the guides were just phenomenal and um one of these people kind of getting a, getting ahead of myself there but one of the people on this trip became seriously ill. They began uh, hallucinating. They were certainly dehydrated. And myself and this other member, we carried this guy. We inspired him. We helped him. We encouraged him. Over the course of those three days, it was amazing uh, because the guides, they weren't doing anything. In fact, they were waiting for one of us to step in. I only found out about that later. But it was that trip, helping this guy in, in what amounted to be this pretty crisis moment for him. Helping him in that moment made me realize what I wanted to do with my life, which was to help people, individuals who've been traumatized thrive, okay? And that sent me back to undergrad. Okay, let me take a sip of coffee here. Hang on. It sent me back to undergrad. I was 18 years out of school at the time. I went back to undergraduate school, went back to graduate school, and um, in one of my internships, 
commuting. Okay, so I was in graduate school for clinical psychology. And as I was commuting to one of my internships, I was uh, it's hours, hour, I mean, the pain is coming back to me now. I was spending about three hours easy in the car every day. And I was thinking to myself, you know, how am I going to use this time? So I started listening to podcasts and I started listening to podcasts of people doing amazing things with their lives because that has always drawn, uh, drawn me to it and inspired me. And I thought to myself, wait, you know, I, I was thinking to myself about my clients and what I should have done, what I could have done. Oh my God, why didn't I do that? And I always wished I'd had a master therapist sitting right beside me. And as I was listening to these podcasts, I thought to myself, if I started interviewing seasoned therapists and uh, talking to them about their struggles, about their journeys, about how they worked, um, and I put two and two together and I said, wait a minute, I can do that. So I started the Trauma Therapist Project. And soon thereafter, my goal I should, I should say that my goal with the Trauma Therapist Project was to help individuals who've been traumatized, number one, raise the awareness of trauma, number two, and help other therapists, really new therapists getting into this field thrive, okay? So I started the Trauma Therapist Pro Podcast, which I should say is now being listened to in, last time I checked, 137 countries around the world. It's pretty crazy. Uh, trauma Therapist 2.0, my community for new trauma therapists. I'll be talking about that a little bit later, so hang on for that. And um, so this is 190 plus, over 190 guests I've had on the podcast so far. I've been fortunate to have really some well-known people, amazing people, and people who are aren't as well known, but certainly Dan Siegel and Gabor Mate are two of those people who are um, prominent figures in the field, pretty well known in the field, um, along with uh, Bruce Perry, Gina Fisher, Peter Levine, um, all these, the list goes on and on. These are some of the more well known people on the podcast. But so that's it for me. I mean, that's a little background about you know, uh, myself, my personal journey, I should say that I'm um, um, married to an amazing woman who's a veterinarian. I've got two kids, one who's seven, one who's two. So the life around here is crazy, as I'm sure uh, your life is crazy too. But um, that's it about me. So let's, let's dive in here. You know, what does it take to get into this field? What does it take to become a, a trauma therapist? And we can go in many directions when we talk about this. But again, what I've done here is I've put together this online training based on and inspired on the information I've garnered through interviewing my amazing guests. Okay, so this just isn't picked out of nowhere. I've, I've really honed uh, what my guests have shared with me, the mistakes I've made, the choices they've made, the avenues that they've gone on to put this together to present to you. And this is uh, based on the PDF, the free PDF, one of the two PDFs that I'm going to uh, give you the link to at the end of this uh, uh, training. So if you hang around, again, hang around for that. That's called the, the Roadmap, 10 Crucial Steps to Guide You Along Your Trauma Education Journey. Uh, the second free PDF I'm going to offer you is um, uh, the book list. But uh, let's start out here with really the three pillars of becoming a trauma therapist. What you need to, um, to, to attend to, what you need to focus on if you want to get into this field, okay? So number one, life experience. Number two, your trauma-informed education. And number three, inner work. And what I've done is I've... Uh, set these um, uh, in different sizes, which indicates their importance. Uh, and this this is my, my importance and what I've determined to be important, the relativity um, in this whole process. But let's start out okay, with life experience. What, what do I mean by life experience? I mean by who you are, by uh who you are, where you've been, your experiences, uh, the education you have to date, who you've become, how all this has defined, described, 
influenced and inspired you. This is all important to you getting into this field and for you becoming a trauma therapist, someone who's specializing in trauma. Uh, your level of confidence, your knowledge, um, the degree to which you believe you have something to offer, the degree to believe, uh, the degree that, that you believe what you have to offer is worthwhile, the belief that your experience matters. Why do I say this? Because when I started out in this field, when I was in graduate school, the one thing, I knew that I wanted to get into trauma therapy when I when I got into school, but I thought that my answers, the answers were out there. The next book, the next workshop, the next um, article, the next chapter, that that's going to give it to me. I thought, I mistakenly thought that that's where my energy needed to go. And yeah, I totally screwed this up because that's not what it is. That's part of it, certainly, but that's not where the, the, the core of you getting into this field, of you becoming a honed, uh, a, an online trauma therapist, if you will, an effective trauma therapist, lies. It doesn't. It's part of it. Again, and I think this quote here, I love this quote. This was shared by uh, Manuel Mishka Reeds on uh, podcast episode 132. She also joins us uh, at Trauma Therapist 2.0. But um, she shared this in her podcast episode, and it was a quote by Choyam Trumpa in the fuel, full, humanist, full human beingness, excuse me, I'm going to read this, and I love it. I think it really sets the context here. The basic work of health professionals in general, and psychotherapists in particular, is to become full human beings and to inspire full human beingness in other people who feel starved about their lives. Man, I love this. And the, the degree to which we can do this is really going to depend upon the degree to which we honor and know and are aware of who we are, okay? And that takes work. It takes self-trust, certainly. It takes belief in ourselves, which I didn't have so much when I got into this field. I mean, I, I didn't have belief in the importance of my experience, of who I was, and realizing that that's going to come into the sessions with me whether I like it or not. And I'm going to have to be aware of that. I'm going to have to own that. And that's where authenticity comes in. We'll talk about that later. But these things are crucial. Um, and the take home here is believing in who we are and the power of our relationship is crucial. And it's enough. It is enough. It's so powerful, our ability to build relationships with the person sitting across from us, the client sitting across from us, the individual who's been traumatized, who may or may not have had a relationship. Certainly, their idea of intimacy and closeness has been distorted, certainly if they've experienced uh, any kind of interpersonal or complex trauma. And our ability, our awareness of who we are, comfortability with who we are, bringing that into the room is crucial, okay? All right, so that's number one. Number two is trauma education, trauma-informed education. Now, this one, again, um, this is an online training. This is, uh, as I say this, I realize these, each of these pillars are huge, and I'm going touching the surface, really. But again, this information really is going to give you a, a, a great stepping stone ideas about how to get started in this field. Okay, so if you have questions, again, uh, jot them down in that question box uh, that's below the um, here. And let's start off with some questions. Your, you know, how you get into this field, what steps you take are going to depend on your purpose or your goal. Okay, uh, for example, back here, why, why are you getting into this field? What do you want to do? Do you want to uh, uh, help young kids? Do you want to create a legacy for yourself, for your family? Do you want to build a community? Do you want to build a, 
a trauma clinic? Do you want to work with a bunch of other people in a hospital setting? All these questions, really, uh, you're going to need to explore because they're going to determine what education you get. For example, what degree or what certificate you go after. Um, let's kind of look at some degrees and certificates. So, you know, whether you want to get a, a master's in family, a master, an MFT, master family therapist, which will allow you to work in uh, the county, certainly county clinics, it allow you to work in private practice. Um, if you want to get an MS in uh, as a crisis counselor, for example, you can do that. Again, each of these degrees have different commitments in terms of schooling, in terms of money, certainly financial output, and in terms of where you can work. If you want to become a social worker, you can also work in the county, you can work in hospital settings, you can work in private settings. Uh, if you want a doctorate, a PhD, or PsyD, you can certainly teach at the university level, you can work in private practice, you can do work in any setting. And just an FYI, a lot of people wondering what the difference is between a PhD and a PsyD, both of which are doctoral level degrees. The PhD has more of an emphasis on research. Uh, the PsyD, at, so this, so as a PhD, which is my degree, there's an emphasis in training on research, and there's also an emphasis on uh, doing clinical work, therapy. The PsyD is strictly uh, a therapist degree, a therapy, therapeutic degree, a clinical setting degree. It has no emphasis on the research aspect. So again, what degree you want to do um, is going to determine your level of education, the, uh, the, the year spent, and so forth. These things really have to be considered. And I think um, you've got to take some time when, when you're doing that as well. Okay. Uh, certainly becoming a counselor. There are addiction counselors working in addiction settings. There are counselors in schools. Okay. And certainly there are certificates in trauma. And I'm going to go over some websites that uh, are really important to know about. They offer certificates um, and so forth. And that is with a certificate, that's going to determine that you've exp um, kind of gone through a particular program or course and provide you a certificate uh, at the, the end. Okay. All right. So again, also consider the environment you'd like to work in. Um, one of the things that helped me determine this was I knew I didn't want to do private practice. I don't like the idea of sitting in a room all day uh, by myself, certainly with clients, but I wanted to be around a bunch of people, which is why I'm working in a clinic. I love that camaraderie. I love talking to people and bouncing ideas off of people. Okay, But where do you want to work? What is your environment? Do you want to work in a school setting? Do you want to work in a hospital? Do you want to work in a rural area? Do you want to work at home? Think about that. Also, the population you'd like to work with. Do you want to work with the young kids? Do you want to work with um, the elderly in a home uh, uh, with individuals who may be experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's? Do you want to work in a hospice setting? Again, all of these are going to uh, be, in a sense, the piece to the puzzle that will help you determine where you want to go, what steps you want to take. And you might not know till you get into it. You might not know till you start doing some um, uh, shadowing or, or, you know, shadowing a therapist or shadowing uh, uh, a psychologist, et cetera. You might not know. Right? All right. So some educational um, options here, um, some schooling, uh, workshops, conferences, reading, consultation groups, uh, mentors, etc. All of these are going to uh, contribute to your trauma-informed education. And if you've been listening to the podcast, this is an ongoing process. It's not as if you, know, you get your degree and that's it, you're good to go. It's I mean, there's so much to learn. There's so much to to focus on and specialize in that you can't really specialize in everything. Uh, but you can be aware of a, a, as much as possible, right? You can kind of focus in on one thing and become a specialist in that. 
All right. Uh, variety is so important. Again, being aware of the variety of modalities out there of sensory motor psychotherapy, and we'll talk about a little bit more about these later, about um, focusing, about hypnosis, about body work, about yoga, and so forth. All right. So one of the things to really be uh, aware of is where are you leaning? What is your gut telling you? Is it telling you that you want to work with kids? Is it telling you that maybe you're scared to work with kids? Is it telling you that maybe you're scared or hesitant to work with the adult population? I will tell you one thing. When I first got into this field, I was at, at the same time hesitant slash scared to work with kids, but knew that I wanted to help them. And I think one of the reasons why I was scared to work with kids because the idea of child abuse with kids freaked me out. I mean, it's just like, it's so awful. It's so scary. And the idea of listening to that, um, at that time when I was, when I was just getting into this field, it was like, oh, it, I, I, it just felt really hard. But as a, and at the same time, I knew that I could help. So getting into this field, uh, slowly becoming educated and getting experience has really allowed me to flourish working with kids. And to this day, I love it. It's, it's what I love to do. All right, but where is your gut? Where are you leaning? What is your gut telling you? Okay, so let's go into um, different modalities. Sorry about that. Um, of different educational uh, trainings and so forth. One is sensory motor psychotherapy. Okay, that was developed by Pat Ogden. Janina Fisher is one of the lead trainers on that. And I put Janina Fisher down there because I was in a consultation group with her, fortunate really to be in a consultation group with her. And she was one of the first people I've had, I had on the podcast. And sensory motor psychotherapy is a somatic-based um, intervention that focuses also on the cognitive, the emotional, the sensory aspects of working with and through trauma. It's phenomenal. It's where the majority of my education and training has been. And uh, I can't speak more highly of it. Uh, Pat Agden, Agden has a new book out. I'll be talking a little bit about that. But this is definitely one intervention, one modality that you want to check out, okay? That's SPI. Um, another is Hakomi. Hakomi is a, a body-based, somatic-based, mindfulness-based modality. Um, Manuela Mishka Reeds, uh, who I mentioned previously, who's on the podcast, also uh, the video interview with Trauma Therapist 2.0, she uh, comes from a Hakomi-based uh, practice, and if you listen to that podcast, you get a really good idea of Hakomi. And again, somatic-based, mindfulness-based. I love the work. Um, sensory motor psychotherapy is really based heavily on Hakomi, okay? Uh, somatic Experiencing by Peter Levine. Um, there are slight differences in uh, somatic experiencing and I should say distinct differences in somatic experiencing and sensory motor psychotherapy. Uh, Peter Levine, one of his, um, I think his seminal work was um, Waking the Tiger. And in that book, he talks about uh, uh, kind of discharging the trauma energy that's trapped in the body. And their work, uh, SE, somatic experiencing work, is really focused on that. Uh, again, Peter Levine had him on the podcast, episodes 37, 38. You can check those out there. Uh, brain spotting started by David Grand, podcast episode 13. Uh, David Grand was a really interesting and inspiring uh, individual uh, for me. I mean, he just exuded, even just through the interview, the audio interview, this this calm, this uh, strength. And what brain spotting is, is it's very similar to EMDR. I don't know a lot about it. I haven't studied it, certainly. But uh, 
Um, it is something that is very similar to EMDR. It doesn't take as much training as EMDR, but I've heard a lot of people talk about its effectiveness. So that's out there, okay? Um, EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing, started by Francine Shapiro, certainly. Very popular in the field right now, very popular with uh, working with veterans. I myself, um, in my own therapy, um, do EMDR. I mean, the therapist that I have is an EMDR therapist, so I get to kind of experience it firsthand, and I will say that it is pretty uh, mind-blowing. I haven't, I haven't studied this. I haven't trained in this, but I, again, I've been on the receiving end of it, and it is uh, really amazing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it at all, it has to do with um, people the therapist uses either a kind of a wand or their finger and moves it back and forth and instructs the client to follow their finger. So you're moving your um, eyes back and forth while thinking of a particular um, event, uh, a traumatizing event. And that shifting of the eye movement, um, and they don't actually know specifically exactly how this works, but they... The understanding is that it, it shifts the experience into a different part of your brain that helps you process and move through it. I can say that it's helped me out a lot. Right. So there are other uh, modalities that I want to list here. Um, ego state work um, um, by uh, Robin Shapiro. She's been on the podcast. Internal Family Systems by uh, Richard Schwartz. Um, psycho. Physical Therapy by Bill Bowen, Inherited Family Trauma, um, uh, Expressive Arts Therapy, Neurofeedback, certainly Seaburn Fisher, and on and on and on. Okay, so the, I, the idea here, there are a lot of modalities, and my suggestion to you is start digging in, find one that works for you. Again, trust your gut on this. If you, if you feel more cognitively based, then CBT. If you feel... Uh, like you're really into the arts and really into e expressive arts, um, maybe expressive arts therapy. Uh, again, likewise for somatic-based work, okay? Um, your task, again, explore, see what fits, pick one and run with it. I mean, you've, you really the idea here is you've got to pick something and go with it to find out even if it doesn't work. Okay, that way you'll know, but you'll begin to develop and cultivate your toolkit, what you have at your belt, your um, uh, collection of interventions. I want to share something with you that uh, Janina Fisher said while I was in her consultation group. I mean, you know, just being in that consultation group with her, this, this I mean, obviously she's a master in the field and just listening to how she's worked and how she works with uh, the other consultees is phenomenal. And I, I'll never forget what she said. She said, the idea for us uh, as therapists is to get to a place where we don't come in with, a, with an agenda, but we are so adept, so seasoned, so experienced, such that we can respond to what our client is bringing to the room. Okay, and that takes work. That takes knowledge and education of not just one intervention, but a variety of them. To be able to move with that um, degree of nimbleness and facility is, is to me, is just so inspiring. All right, you guys doing okay so far? Um, let's take a little coffee break right here. Let me take a coffee sip. All right, so pick one and then don't stop. Continue going, continue exploring. And let me share with you now some go-to resources, um, really just some awesome sites that you really need to be aware of uh, if you, uh, when you start getting into this field. One, the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Association, the ISSTD, a leader, uh, major kind of organization in the field. They have a lot of trainings. They have a lot of information. They have a lot of um, online training and webinars. Definitely check them out, isst.org. They also are one of the uh, major um, uh, conferences in, in every year. So 
Uh, another one, National Child Traumatic Stress Network, nctsn.org. Obviously, this is really focused on uh, children, childhood trauma, complex trauma. Again, they have a lot of information, a lot of educational resources on this site. This is an awesome site. Um, really will keep you abreast of what's going on in this field, okay? Uh, another one, the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. I know these are kind of beginning to sound alike, but they are different, believe me. This is um, ISTSS again. Um, they have met, all these uh, sites have membership, and this one also has a lot of um, online trainings, uh, webinars, and information. A great one to uh, check out to get informed. Finally, read, read read i mean again this is coming from so many of the guests that i've had on this podcast so many of the guests that talk about their journeys and what's been important to them is this constant learning this constant reading informing ourselves okay so to that end i want to share with you some uh really some choice books in the field the body keeps a score certainly by Bessel van der Kolk, his most recent book this book is just phenomenal it, it and i love it because I mean, here he is he's a doctor he's a psychiatrist he was really in on this in on uh ptsd and uh, from the get-go in a sense of classifying it as a um uh, a disorder, if you will, but he he was in on it from the beginning when research was was done. But he comes from a very open perspective and a holistic perspective that I just find so inspiring. He's uh, always looking at different modalities, for example, yoga, um, neurofeedback, and somatic based work. And he talks a lot about the many interventions that are useful in this book. Definitely, if you haven't gotten this book, go get it now. The Polyvagal Theory, really one of the foundational books on um, uh, neurophysiology of trauma. Stephen Porges is one of the leaders in the field. Um, it's This book is, uh, I would say, a little more academic, but certainly it's going to really provide you with a lot of information on the uh, specifics of how trauma uh, affects the brain, or I should say, yeah, how trauma affects the brain and the body as well. Uh, I had mentioned this, um, Pat Ogden's latest book, Central Motor Psychotherapy. This book is a overview, a really dense, not dense, but I should say exhaustive, chock full book of uh, Central Motor Psychotherapy. It gives you a really great idea of the work that she does, the work of uh, Sensory Motor Psychotherapy. Highly recommend this book. Uh, Coping with Trauma Related Association by uh, Suzette Boone and Kathy Steele. Um, Kathy Steele was on the podcast, just a great, great interviewee. This book is great for both the clinician and the therapist alike, which is why I like it. And it gives the, the therapist ideas about how to work with individuals who experience dissociation and also individuals who are experiencing dissociation gives them a lot of ideas about what they can do, uh, how they can help themselves. So really something that you can even work with your client. You can get this and work with your client um, simultaneously. All right. Uh, the Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, probably my favorite book uh, among all of these by Bruce Perry. Um, Bruce Perry was also um, on the podcast. And I'm just telling you that these individuals were on the podcast. So if you want to go back and listen to their interviews, you can. I, I love this book because he really provides case studies about individuals he's worked with and how he's worked with them. And he really talks about the uh, kind, of, kind of going back to what Manuela Mishka reads, quoted, the full human beingness that's necessary to work in this field uh, to help individuals who've been traumatized. It's crucial. I, I love it. And I keep coming back to that aspect of full human beingness. Um, but this book is, is just phenomenal. 
Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman. This is probably the most often recommended book um, by my guests on the podcast. It's, it's the kind of seminal work in the field, still relevant today, kind of a go-to and something that you've got to have in your library um, if you're getting into this field. All right, so those are some books. I, I do want to say again that I have a free download for you, a PDF download of a short, uh, awesome book list, which has different books than I've just mentioned, but you can get that. I'm going to give you the URL towards the end of this uh, training. Uh, so hang around for that. All right, so also in your education, finding a mentor is crucial. I mentioned that I was in a consultation group with Gina Fisher, and that experience was just so inspiring for me. It, it, it was just so phenomenal. It just really helped me along my journey here. But we can find mentors, again, in consultation groups, in, in our supervisors, in our communities online. Again, I'm going to be talking about my community online, Trauma Therapist 2.0. Uh, we can also find them with our friends, with our colleagues. All right. Oh, I want to recommend to you some awesome trainings. I'm not affiliates with any of these people. I'm not getting money for, for recommending these to you. But these are resources that I want to offer to you because they're awesome. These people are just amazing um, uh, therapists, uh, workers in their field, and I highly recommend their trainings. I've taken a number of trainings by Danita Fisher. I can't recommend her enough. Um, you can see the... Uh, URL there, JaninaFisher.com. Okay, just check that out. That'll take you right to her training. Manuela Mishka Reads, I've mentioned her a number of times, but just a phenomenal uh, therapist. Again, someone who I who I think whose vision really is embodies what I'm trying to do in this field. Again, I'm not I don't get any kickbacks from these people, but I want to offer you um, Places I think are great. Um, Manuel Mishkareeds.com and certainly Molly um, Boder Harris. Harris, excuse me. Uh, she's also been on the podcast and uh, she's provided, created an amazing yoga and trauma informed community. It gives you a lot of information. Uh, look up Molly Boder, ha Boder Harris. Okay. So the take home as far as the training goes is the books you read. Are crucial. The workshops you attend are crucial. The um, webinars are crucial. You have to be supported by your self trust, by your self belief, by who you are. And this next and final color here is the inner work. Okay. I love this. This, this is where it's at here. And I want to start with this quote by Gene Gendlin, and he's kind of uh, the, the founder of Focusing, which is a kind of mindfulness somatic-based uh, work that is often used with trauma. But I, I love this quote, and I'm gonna read it to you here because it's so uh, crucial and integral to what we're talking about here. I wanna start with the most important thing I have to say. The essence of working with another person is to be present as a living being. And that is the lucky, because if we had to be smart or good or mature or wise, then we probably would be in trouble. But what matters is not that. What matters is to be a human being with another human being, to recognize the other person as another being in there. Even if it is a cat or a bird, if you're trying to help a wounded bird, the first thing you have to know is that there's somebody in there and that you have to wait for that person, that being in there, to be in contact with you. That seems to me to be the most important thing. Man, I, I just love it. That gets me so inspired because this work, this work we're doing is not easy. In fact, if you've been listening to the podcast and you've heard so many of the interviewees that have had on the podcast talk about their crucial mistake, it's been, it's been about this. It's been centered on this, not being able to be in contact with who they are, about relying on other aspects, relying on their education, relying on their trauma to get them through. Inner work, I'm talking about compassion. I'm talking about authenticity and presence and self-nourishment. I'm talking about attunement. I'm talking about rapport. Okay, I'm talking about connecting 
acknowledging, being aware of our own fears, our own biases and traumas, because they will be triggered in the session. Our own fears, biases, and traumas will be triggered in session with our clients. We're going to get to those in a little bit. But let me ask you the question that I ask every guest on my podcast is what's your why? Why are you doing this? What's driving you? Why do you, why do you want this? I'm not testing you. I'm just asking you to ask yourself because the, the, our answer is going to determine how we do what we do. Does that make sense? For example, I knew that I wanted to get into this field because I love like just reaching in to people metaphorically and connecting and helping people who've been traumatized, helping people who've been down and out. I feel that I can help, that I can do it, that I can help people, that I can be a guide for them in a sense. And believe me, when I say that, I am not a master therapist, but I'm, I'm moving along my own journey, okay? But I want to invite you to ask yourself, what's your why? What drives you? What's driving you to do this work? What's motivating you to do this work? This, in a sense, your answer, again, is your beacon of hope. It will keep you alive. It will keep you on fire when you don't know what the heck you're doing. And there will be times when you walk out of a session, you're like, what am I doing? When you're driving and you're thinking about your client, you're like, oh my God, why did I do that? Why didn't I do that? Okay. Your why will keep you focused, on track, online, excited. Oh, oh sorry about that. So your why will also very much determine how much you feel you need to fix people because you've heard it time and time again. Our job is not to fix people. Our job is not to take away our client's journey, their path, and supplant it with our own. Our job is to be a guide and to, to help our clients move through that journey, whatever that journey is. Your, the interventions you use are going to be determined by your biases, your fears. If you're, if you're scared of, of uh, sitting in a room with a kid who's experienced trauma, who's experienced complex trauma, interpersonal trauma like I was, okay, um, it's going to be impacted by your own traumas, by your own uh, the bullying you've experienced like I have, by your own interpersonal trauma, if you experience that, or PTSD, okay? These are something that you have to take stock of and be aware of. And again, this is, this is a process, okay? It's not something that you look at once and boom, you're good to go. It's a process. It's not easy. This is where the difficulty, the challenge, I should say, comes in for us as therapists, Okay? Therapy and you. Should you get into your own therapy? Hell yes. You need to get into your own therapy if you're going to go through this work. Why? Because you will be triggered. And uh, when you're in session with another client, it's, it's going to happen. You're, you're human. It happens to each of us. But if And if we haven't done our own work, if we haven't done our own exploration and cultivated that awareness for ourselves, we're going to be in a session. And instead of work, the, working on our client, we're going to be ending up doing our own work in that session, okay? That's not what we want to have happen, okay? So explore your stuff, explore your biases, explore your fears, traumas. Granted, this can be done in supervision. This can be done in consultation to a certain degree, okay? Um, it's also, it's kind of a secondary benefit in a sense to do to getting into your own therapy, uh, it's going to provide you with the experience of being the recipient of different interventions. Like I talked about myself, uh, my my therapist now, she's an EMDR therapist, and I get to experience what it is like to uh, have the EMDR done on myself, and that's it's been pretty eye opening. Okay, it's kind of a secondary benefit. All right, let's talk about authenticity. I love this topic. Sorry, you can I keep saying I love this, but I, I just love this work. And 
I hope you do too. And I hope you're getting inspired. Authenticity, the degree to which we can be ourselves, how to, how to cultivate it, dare to be yourself, being authenticity, being true to one's own personality, spirit, or character. And oftentimes it's not easy. Oftentimes we think we have to be something when we're, you know, when we're starting out, when we're getting into this field, certainly I hung, clung tightly to my therapist hat. You know, I thought therapists needed to act a certain way or be a certain way or say certain things. And I spent a lot of time doing that and really not just easing up and being who I was. That means maybe feeling certain things in session. And hear me, hear me clearly. I'm not saying be overly emotional, but just being a person, being a person in relationship with the person sitting before us. Okay. Genuineness in therapy means that the therapist is his or her actual self during his encounter with the client. Without facade, he or she openly has the feelings and attitudes that are flowing in him or her at the moment. This involves self-awareness. The therapist encounters their client directly, meaning the person, meaning him person to person. The therapist is being him or herself, not denying themselves. It's not simple to achieve such reality. Being real involves a difficult task of being acquainted with the flow of experiencing going on with oneself, within oneself, a flow marked especially by complexity and continuous change. That was by Jermaine. Light Tower. Okay. This is a, a such a crucial integral component to consider when you're getting into this field. Again, if you're if you're eager to take your step, what should I do? Where should I go? This is something that you have to keep in mind. This is something that can be cultivated through meditation, for example, through through honoring who we are, going back to that first pillar. Okay, this quote here by Peter Bernstein, episode one ninety, episode ninety one, phenomenal episode. We have to remember that we're no different than our clients. And honestly, when I started this, my training, I thought I was. But honestly, I, of course I did, and this is why this has been such a learning experience for me. Because when you think or believe you're so different from your clients, okay, you're going to be acting a different way. You're going to be in session doing different things than if you realize that we are no different than our clients, okay? There are going to be two different types of relationships formed. Putting ourselves in positions where we can get and accept feedback, raising our level of awareness, all these contribute to us cultivating our authenticity, our ability to be present with another person, okay? Talked about meditation, talked about honoring uh, who we are again, again, again. Love this. Um, cultivating authenticity can also be finely tuned by checking in with ourselves. You know, before, during, even after our sessions, being aware of what we're feeling, where we're at. Where, where's our emotional level today? Where's our anxiety level today? Where's our the ability to which we can settle in and kind of feel our own bodies. Where are we today? Okay, that's a, a, a kind of a, a scan, um, a level of awareness that we're going to have to cultivate as we're getting into this. What do we do for self-nourishment? Uh, I love this term as opposed to kind of self-care. This is the term, self-care certainly is a term that we talk a lot, a lot about in this field. And I, I think we just kind of let it go uh, in one ear and out the other. But what are we doing to take care of ourselves? Because we will need it. Um, whatever it is, you know, we're taking walks. Are we setting time aside for ourselves to relax, to um, uh, decompress? Okay. This is something that you want to get in on as soon as you get into this field, as soon as you get into uh, starting to get into this field. Okay. Start doing it now. Don't wait till you're too stressed out. All right. So let's talk about some fundamental and crucial skills, okay, that are necessary for um, really becoming a trauma therapist for doing this work. I'm not going to talk about a lot of them, but I am going to talk about a few of them, and I want to share them with you right now. The first of which is how to talk about 
trauma. You know, you probably often heard that, uh, you know, really talking about trauma isn't really the oftentimes the first uh, go-to intervention. Why? Because trauma really um, is held in a different part of the brain than our uh, the verbal part of our brain. It's held in our body, the visual part, and in our body. But there comes a time when you've got to talk about it, when it's necessary to talk about it. And for example, when I work in a clinic and I'm doing assessments um, and I'm asking people if they've experienced it, we're talking about it to a certain degree. But let me start with this quote here. What occurs within the therapeutic dyad will be strongly influenced by the therapist's window of tolerance as much as by the client's, okay? The window of tolerance is a kind of concept which defines is defined by kind of on the upper level, if you will, hypervigilance. And on the lower level, at the low bottom part of this window, numbing, depression, um, and it, but in the middle is that kind of optimal zone where people are able to uh, uh, process and even speak about trauma. Okay, if someone's so depressed, so numbed out, even dissociated, they're not going to be able to certainly process or talk about trauma. Likewise, if someone is in uh, hypervigilant, if they're uh, exceedingly anxious, um, they're not going to be able to talk about it as well. But this this middle zone, this kind of optimal window of tolerance, is pertains to us as clinicians as well as our clients, okay? We have to be aware of where we're at. Bruce Perry says, regulate, then relate, then reason. Okay, I love this quote. In, in terms of what's important um, uh, chronologically of how to move forward in working with a client. Obviously, the client has to be regulated. Uh, we have to have that relationship with them and then we can move forward with reasoning. Okay. When we're talking about trauma, it's easy, it's gentle, don't push, for example, like I did with my brother, brother I nagged him. Um, have you experienced any trauma? Something that oftentimes doesn't work for a number of reasons. Most times, people uh, don't know what trauma is. Most uh, a lot of times, people associate trauma with PTSD, for example, with and associate veterans with PTSD. So trauma can be many things, but oftentimes, broadly, it's very helpful to start out with a general term and then move to specifics. For example, um, how safe do you feel in your home? If I'm doing an assessment with a young kid and I'm inquiring about trauma, this is a good first question I might ask, you know, how safe do you feel in your home? Who do you feel safe with? Okay. I'll use this scale, the zero to 10 scale. On a scale of zero to 10, with zero being very unsafe and 10 being very safe, how safe do you feel in your home? How safe do you feel with your father, with your mother? This is such a deceptively um, uh, phenomenal scale, seemingly easy scale, because it gives you a lot of information. If someone says, I feel, um, I feel about a 10. So 10 being very safe. That's going to give you a lot of information, a lot of different information than if someone says, I feel two. So that's pretty unsafe. Okay. Um, the degree to which it's going to let you know that someone is aware of where they're at. It's going to let you know um, maybe that certain interventions have to take place. Okay, this is a scale you can utilize with clients for depression, for anxiety. It's, it provides a common measurement. Okay. Right. Um, I use this with, like I said, uh, where are you with uh, your depression this week? Is it uh, at a 10 feeling the most depressed you've ever felt or the most anxious? Again, this is going to give you the tools to say, okay, so I need to uh, come up with an intervention or we need to come up even better with an intervention here to help this client move along. All right. So in terms of your next step, education, if you're looking for um, uh, 
the next step in terms of getting your education, if you're looking for support, a community that will support you to get into this field, if you're looking for uh, a group of people, an environment, a community to inspire you, I want to invite you to seriously consider my community, Trauma Therapist 2.0. This is an online membership that is specifically geared for new trauma therapists like yourself. We have support. We have education. We have inspiration. Um, it is a place where you can come and get all of these things. It's a holistic. What I've done here is I've created a holistic community that's filled with guests representing a variety of modalities from the field of trauma, addiction, mindfulness, and yoga. I have interviewed, do I do video interviews with thought leaders, massive therapists in the field. Okay. And you look at the experience, like I talked about, the trauma education, the inner work, each of these three pillars we focus in on trauma therapist 2.0 what some people have said guy i love your podcast your community trauma therapist 2.0 and facebook group because it's fueled my passion for trauma work as i begin my career um, so grateful for the work you're doing thank you so trauma therapist 2.0 is comprised of three components one educational videos two the private facebook group Okay, and three fundamental skills videos. So let's look at these each in turn. The educational instructional video interviews that I do with thought leaders and masters in the field are different from the podcast. And the podcast, obviously, which is only audio to begin with, I really focus in on their journey, what's inspired them. Trauma Therapist 2.0, these video interviews, okay, my goal here is to break down step by step how they work with their clients what they do specifically and have them share that with you in an easily digestible format so you can go out and implement some of those things as well okay this takes my podcast to a different level trauma therapist 2.0 these interviews about 30 to 45 minutes and again i'm getting much different information, more educational component here for my members at Trauma Therapist 2.0. These are some of the uh, amazing guests I've had on the field. And again, what I've done here is I've collected a variety of um, backgrounds here, not just uh, trauma and dissociation, but if you look here, there's Becky Cohen, who uh, speaks to the trans transgender clients. Uh, Kathleen Kendall Hackett talks about trauma and health. Uh, Tina Brian Davis talks about surviving and thriving from a wellness perspective. What do you need to do to get into this field to be a well-rounded clinician? This will provide you with that. Andrew Hahn talks about energy psychology. There's Richard Schwartz uh, treating parts. I mean, the list goes on and on. Okay, so the second part of Trauma Therapist 2.0 are fundamental skills videos. And in these videos that are short, concise, five to 10 minute videos, what I do, these videos are done by myself. I go into different topics like grounding, baselines, and I provide you golden nuggets of information and inspiration so that you can go out and work with your clients, okay? Again, these are uh, short, concise, five to 10 minute videos on such topics as stabilizing your client, safety, creating safety, creating regulation, grounding, the window of tolerance, which I talked a little bit, bit about, and many, many more, okay? That's the second component. The third component, I love this, is the private Facebook group, okay? So private as in only members in Trauma Therapist 2.0 are join, can join, and contribute and also get the benefit of being in a group of other new trauma therapists okay um, this is where people share stories share their wins share their challenges share what they're learning share their different trainings they're taking so being part of a group like this you get not only do you get support knowing that there are other people going through this process as well but you benefit from what they're doing benefit from their wins benefit from 
uh, listening to what's inspiring them. And hopefully you can inspire them too. Okay, so here's another kind of blurb about what, what people are saying. Uh, guys made an important, important contribution to the profession for education, resources, and community for trauma-focused therapists, new and experienced. Had he not found out about his podcast at the Trauma Therapist Project, and membership in Trauma Therapist 2.0 it would have taken me much longer to find out about how to progress in this important clinical focus. And that's another thing. I mean, honestly, if I had something like this when I was first starting out, it's like it would have been awesome. You're plugged into a community of individuals who are moving through their process, and thereby you just have this automatic support system. All right, so let me take you a little bit behind the scenes of Trauma Therapist 2.0. Um, so let's go into it here. So this is the uh, main page of Trauma Therapist 2.0, which you can get to by going to traumatherapist2.com. And there's that opening video by myself. Here's a list of therapists and their bios. Um, what's involved, um, the, the videos, the private Facebook group. Um, and at the bottom there is a list of uh, just kind of teaser videos, little excerpts from each of the interviews I've done, which are just amazing there. And that'll give you access to a lot of the uh, videos I've had. You can go on and, and just see teaser videos. Um, again, these are a list of um, that's Manuel Amishka Reeves right there. That is kind of the uh, the interface of what it looks like, what the interface looks like when you become a member. Because it's beautiful, very kind of clean. Here is the list of skills and interventions videos I've done, suspiciousness, clinical errors, grounding, baselines, uh, the window of tolerance. That's what it looks like when you click on there. You get a really kind of uh, energetic, I hope, video by myself there. Um, and that's what uh, it looks like when you go to Trauma Therapist 2.0. Okay. If you're ready to begin your journey, um, again, if you're looking for a community that will support you, that's going to inspire you, if you're looking to really hone uh, you know, the three pillars I talked about of uh, the importance of your life experience, your education, and uh, inner work, if you're looking for trauma-informed education by thought leaders in the field, I want to invite you to become a member right now, Trauma Therapist 2.0. And this is a URL, traumatherapist2.com. Okay, go to traumatherapist2.com, and this will uh, be the page that pops up. Okay, you can enroll, choose your um, plan for enrollment if you want to enroll by the month. It's three thirty-seven per month, or it's three seventeen per year. Uh, this payment page will come right up. It'll invite you to put in your uh, credit card and number. Uh, again, it's 37 a month, 317 per year. However, for those who are on this training right now, this is available only to you on this training. I'm giving you guys a discount of 27 a month and 232 per year. I mean, for for this forum, for this uh, community that I put together, it's a pretty awesome deal if I do say so myself. And again, you can get that by going to traumatherapist2.com. Okay, and putting in the discount code trauma guy. That's one word, trauma guy. That um, code trauma guy will get you your monthly rate at twenty-seven dollars and your yearly rate at two thirty-two, and that's pretty great savings here. All right. So finally, I want to uh, provide the URLs for the two PDFs, free PDFs I told you about. The first one is a roadmap, and that's the traumatherapistproject.com backslash map. Okay. The traumatherapistproject.com backslash map, or is that forward slash? Um, actually, I think it's a forward slash map. Okay. That's the first one, the trauma therapist project forward slash map. And then secondly, the trauma therapist project forward slash book list. Okay. Those are two free And the traumatherapistproject.com forward slash book list. All right, guys, that's it. I want to see you, love to see you uh, become a member at Trauma Therapist uh, 2.0. 
love to take part uh, along this journey with you. And that is it. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me. I, I so appreciate it. Um, any questions, uh, shoot me an email and I will see you. All right, take care.